want to go first, Brad? Oh, okay. All right. Let me pick up some threads. Um, let me pick up some threads that I think have been implicit in most of what has been said up here in this session, but may, may be rather less polite as befits a dismal scientist and make, I think, four points that need to be made because they are important about the architecture of Asia. Um, the first is that Asia, both East Asia and South Asia, have been more successfully expansionary in their policy mixes in this financial crisis than have the developed economies of the North Atlantic, and their policies have been remarkably successful in cushioning the crisis and restarting growth, and that North Atlantic policymakers and academics should take note, and to my dismay and somewhat horror, by and large, they have not. Um, the fact that the Asian countries' recipes for dealing with the crisis have been more successful than those of the North Atlantic and perhaps deserve some imitation is not part of the North Atlantic debate for reasons that escape me. Um, second, um, having just complimented Asia, um, let me now warn it right, that Asia is now riding high um, not so much here, um, where we are all dismal scientists, but elsewhere in the great wide world. Um, you hear lots of policymakers, lots of public intellectuals, lots of politicians um, talking about how well it's revealed that the doctrines of the North Atlantic were largely the emperor's new clothes that economists may well have forgotten a great deal and been distracted by a great deal in the run-up to the financial crisis, and, but they were also simply wrong. Um, hence, I hear more and more often, um, Asia does not have all that much to learn from the accumulated human capital of economists and policymakers in the North Atlantic, and this, I think, would be a big mistake that after all, economists did know a great deal um, about financial crises and have to deal with, how to deal with them. Although it is embarrassing that when Larry Summers is asked what influenced him that he found helpful, he names a book published in 1873. Um, that is when cutting edge economics of macroeconomics of 1873 is our new and relevant economic thinking. We are in significant trouble. Um, nevertheless, ignorance by Asia of the context and history of financial crisis may well lead to hubris, which then runs a risk of being followed by nemesis, and being followed by nemesis for two reasons. First, Asian growth is now rapid. Asian expectations are now extrapolative. Everyone buying assets in Asia expects the current growth pattern to continue. Uh, perhaps for 20 years, perhaps for more, perhaps for 10 years, perhaps for even for five, but they all expect it to continue and they all price that continuance of rapid growth into asset prices. And to the extent that there are bears who are cautious, well, as growth continues, they will find that their cautious portfolios have been outperformed by others. And according to Charlie Kindleberger's precept that nothing so deranges your mind as to watch your friends become rich, um, they too will abandon um, the chase and seek to bid and buy on extrapolative expectations as well. And there will be a slowdown in Asian growth at some point. At the moment, it is catch-up catch growth, easy transfer of well-established technologies, relatively easy boostings of savings rates and increases in capital output ratios, relatively easy pieces of the acquisition of human capital. This catch-up growth inevitably slows as you reach the limits of capital accumulation, as you reach the most difficult parts of education, as you reach for those technologies that are harder to transfer over and that have to be adapted. The slowdown may be five years away, it may be 10, it may be 25. Um, it is unlikely to be more. When it comes, whenever it comes, it will hit Asian economies that will then be expecting and pricing an extra five to 10 years of growth just as rapid as the past generation, and growth during the past generation has been phenomenal, into asset prices. And when the slowdown comes, asset prices will then move far and fast. Fourth, global imbalances. 
not so very many years from now, Beijing alone will have 40 trillion yuan invested in dollar-denominated assets, and sometime exchange rates will move. When they do, those 40 trillion renminbi will be worth 30 trillion or 25 trillion or 20 trillion renminbi. Those 40 trillion have been borrowed from the good burgers of Shanghai. Um, the good burgers of Shanghai will want them back. Um, when the slowdown comes and they want them back, asset prices will then move far and fast. And asset prices that move far and fast are recipes for financial crisis. Um, let me go back before, well before Walter Badgett. Let me go back to Jean-Baptiste Say, who did not, you may not know, really want to be an academic economist. He wanted to be a policymaker. He wanted to be a finance minister someday. In fact, Jean-Baptiste Say was special assistant to French Secretary of the Treasury, Etienne Clavier, during the First French Republic. And then his boss was purged, arrested, imprisoned, tortured, sentenced to death, and cheated the guillotine by suiciding the night before his planned execution. Um, somehow, Say escaped with not only his life, but also his freedom and even his property, and decided it was much safer to retire to the countryside and write books of economics than to play the high-stakes game of French politics and bureaucracy. Um, and back in 1829, Say wrote one of the very first analyses of the very first industrial depression, the bust of the British canal boom of the early 1820s and its consequences. And the lesson he drew was that a financial crisis was the only time in which Say's law was false, the only time when supply did not create its own demand, the only time when the private sector could not by itself create the safe and liquid means of payment and other financial assets of appropriate duration, that would eliminate any excess planned demand for finance which might induce a general glut. Um, it turned out um, that Say was right, and that ever since, whenever depressions have become deep, it's been because a financial crisis has deranged the private sector's ability to settle its own kind of internal financial arrangements among itself by having private agents prov to provide each other with credit. Um, when these asset prices in Asia move far and fast, either because the dollar has collapsed, or because East Asian growth has slowed markedly, or because both, those movements of asset prices are the kinds of things that shake the foundations of trust needed for the private sector to be able to do the intermediation to make Say's law true in practice, even if it's not true in theory. So back in 2005, we were discussing what the next financial crisis was going to be. And back then, those discussions were highly theoretical, and they focused around a crisis that might come someday if global imbalances were not dealt with. And you could call that a dollar crisis or a reorientation of Asian development crisis, some, whatever, it was the same thing. That crisis is still out there, is still possible. The success of Asia in surmounting this last crisis says little about its ability to surmount the next one, and that potential crisis is now six years closer. <laughs>